Hi, do you feel like any number of legs over four is unjustifiable? So I got the idea for this video when I was researching another video and I came across this paper titled Mad Scientist, the Unique Case of a Published Delusion and I thought it was absolutely fascinating. It's about an entomologist, bug scientist, who thought insects were crawling under her skin and published her experience as a case study. Uh, let me tell you, it is not convincing. <laughs> this case brings up a very interesting debate about how mental fitness should be evaluated when it comes to science and we'll go into that in detail soon also about the way scientific publishing can go wrong sometimes. It's a great opportunity to, to discuss in a bit of detail why we generally don't seem to like insects all that much and how that means they can be played for cheap scares in movies and media in general. What do you think of my mug? Do you think it's enough to piss off entomologists? What we are dealing with here is quite sensitive and I want to avoid seeming like I'm trying to sensationalize it or that I'm making fun of this person, which I absolutely do not, and I'll try my best at talking about it in a thoughtful way. Just a quick content warning though, right at the beginning. I'm going to talk about phobias, insects, parasites and there will be some mentions of self-harm, so you know we don't bounce. If you have difficulty seeing pictures of insects, even hearing about them, feel free to skip this one. Some of the things I'll talk about are a bit unsettling, just don't say I didn't warn you. Also, sorry to anyone watching, I'm going to use bug and insect interchangeably in this video. If that bothers you, I guess you'll just have to deal with it. In 1951, in the journal with this quite wordy name, Proceedings of the Entomological Society of Washington, an unusual article appeared titled Unusual Scab Dermatitis in Humans Caused by the Mite Dermatophagoides. This aforementioned mite is a well-known species. It can be found in nearly every household and are commonly known as dust mites. Their scientific name comes from the Greek words derma, meaning skin, and phago, meaning to eat, together creating skin eaters. No need to panic though, they're not eating the skin off people, they only eat the dead skin cells collecting around the house as dust and they can't parasitize humans, but regularly go about their business in our beds, but there's so much of that delicious shed skin cells. This doesn't mean they are without problems though. Their feces contains one of the most common allergens in industrialized areas such as Germany. Nearly every one in four people are allergic to them. The author of this paper, Jay Traver, was an entomologist. She was mainly working with mayflies and co-authored a book in their biology, which was once described as the cornerstone of American mayfly entomology. She wasn't a bad scientist, apparently, when she was of sound mind. She could do great work. Insects are something we humans just love to hate. They fascinate and terrify us at the same time, which is probably why they are a steady staple of the horror genre. Arachnophobia, I know spiders aren't technically insects, it's the most researched and I'll generally default to talking about arachnophobia in this video mostly. Insects are very different to us and this difficulty in relating to them causes some people to have a strong aversion sometimes followed by a morbid curiosity, the same way we would stop to look at a horrific car crash. Or, you know, consume horror. Or true crime. Some insects are more likely to cause negative reactions than others, like grasshoppers. Many people hate them even though they are completely harmless other than being capable of reaching insane numbers in populations and destroying crops people's livelihoods depend on. 
cockroaches. They can't even sting, but many people are disgusted by even the sight of them and associate their presence with filth. And this latter phenomenon isn't by accident. When navigating a world where you eat the eat or get eaten, especially surrounded by beings that are much, much larger than you are, it's a very good survival mechanism to make yourself utterly repulsive. There's this beetle, whose name I'm not going to pronounce, coats their eggs with a very bad tasting goo that predators won't like. And some grasshoppers, like this one, will empty all their bodily fluids, including vomiting a brown liquid on you when they're startled. When you're disgusting, predators won't want to eat you. Phobias aren't simple fears, though. We can talk about why we generally don't like certain insects, most of us have no problems with butterflies and ladybugs, but coming across a spider, lots of people face a debilitating fear. When arachnophobes are asked about their fears of spiders, interestingly, the thing that comes up often isn't the spider itself. It's what a spider could potentially do. Of course, this is a bit of a silly argument. You're not afraid of dogs, you're afraid of getting bit. But there is a point to it. Even if the fear itself is sometimes irrational, some spiders can't even bite, like the interestingly named daddy long legs. But this knowledge won't help arachnophobes and they'll still be scared of even harmless spiders. There are spiders that can give you quite nasty bites, so while there's a basis for the fear itself, it's not warranted in many cases. When people with arachnophobia are in close proximity to a spider, they'll imagine the spider to be angry, vengeful, they're afraid of it lunging towards them, biting them, then the bite hurting really bad, the wound getting infected and their limbs will have to be chopped off or something similar. This thought process is what psychology calls catastrophizing. The steps might follow a semi-logical path, but the jump from there's a spider to I'm gonna lose my legs is a bit too much. The fear of what the spider could do is also exaggerated. Phobics tend to overestimate their probability of getting bit by about eight times as likely compared to non-phobics. Even when they're side by side with another human, there's a spider in front of them, they think they have a higher chance of the spider biting them rather than the other person. It has to be noted that research shows that we do have a certain predisposition to pick up fears of spiders. When research subjects were trained to fear certain images by receiving small electric shocks, people learned to fear spiders a lot quicker than they did more neutral images such as pictures of houses, flowers, etc. People afraid of insects or spiders won't rationalize their fears when they're in the moment either. They might get to the conclusion of losing their legs when pushed for an answer, but mostly, I think, they won't really try to rationalize it at all. They just accept that spiders are scary and disgusting, and as long as they avoid them, there's no need to deal with their fears. But this imagined possible outcome has something in common with other insects perceived as disgusting. In this case, it's not necessarily the spider that is a disgusting creature. It's rather seen as something that causes a disgusting outcome, like a badly infected bite. The role of disgust when it comes to spiders and insects is not straightforward. But feelings usually aren't straightforward. It's most likely a mix of fear and disgust. Disgust is why you won't approach a cockroach, but fear is why you run away when it starts skittering. It keeps us away from potentially harmful things. But sometimes our monkey brains can't tell the difference between harmful and harmless when they share certain characteristics. And as we can use being repulsed by insects and spiders to our advantage, they can use being repulsive to their advantage as well. Interestingly, those insects that are the most likely to transmit potentially deadly diseases aren't as common subjects of phobias as spiders and grasshoppers that are not as likely to do so. Mosquitoes spread malaria that to this day kills around 600,000 people yearly. Ticks spread Lyme disease that can have debilitating long-term consequences if left untreated. 
A third of Europe got wiped out due to the bubonic plague that was spread by fleas in the 14th century. Yet, these animals aren't as subject to fears from humans. Why? Could be because other animals crank their repulsiveness up to 100 because they don't rely on mammals to feed on. They get an advantage from mammals avoiding them. If we were as repulsed by mosquitoes as we tend to be by spiders, they would have a lot harder time surviving. Of course, this doesn't mean we like those insects either. Jeffrey Lockwood, psychologist, philosopher and entomologist, summarized in his book the properties of which our fears of insects are rooted. They can invade our homes and bodies. Let's put a pin in this one. Evade us through quick and unpredictable movements. They can undergo rapid population growth, threatening our sense of individuality harm us both directly and indirectly. They look alien to us, which creates an aversion on our part. And they can defy our will through their mindless autonomy. You can't reason with a wasp to leave you alone the way you might be able to with a dog. When filmmakers want to tap into these fears, they tend to exaggerate these alien features. Several old-timey movies, such as the 1959 The Tingler, with its gigantic centipede, portray large, very off-putting insect-like creatures. The Fly movies, both 1958 and 86, rely on showing what we perceive as the worst aspects of insects, which is how the horror genre tends to deal with them. During the Cold War, movies featuring gigantic bugs and insects were super popular, Today, this is mainly attributed to anxieties to, to nuclear threats. Often the bugs became gigantic and dangerous due to some kind of nuclear accident, like the ants in the box office hit Them in 1954. They're also always destroyed thanks to the heroic actions of the military. On the other hand, insects or spiders possess abilities we sometimes see as admirable or even cool. Take Spider-Man as an example. Peter Parker is bitten by a radioactive spider and gets the best of both worlds. He can climb walls, shoot webs from his wrist, in some versions, in others he uses a machine to do that. He gets his spidey sense that can detect incoming danger, but he also gets to keep his human form, the bite repairs his vision and gets some sick abs out of the whole deal. Even the creator saw how idealistic that whole thing was and in the What If comic series issue 88 they explored the idea what if the bite didn't merely give spider abilities to him but instead turned Peter Parker into a spider-like creature completely. Also bees. We like them, they pollinate our plants, make honey, they are relatively harmless, only sting by self-defense, they are considered to be hard workers and they symbolize the idea of how an individual can submit themselves to achieve a greater goal as part of a community. Even though we admire that commitment, this hive mind can also be frightening. One bee might cause a slight discomfort by stinging. Not considering allergic reactions right now, but a swarm of bees might kill you. Sometimes in cartoons they aren't shown as individual bees, but as a single cloud-like entity. Also, this hive mindset can be a great vehicle for individualistic stories as well. Like the bee movie. You like jazz? Jesus Christ, why does this fucking thing exist? I'm just kidding. I'm very happy it does. <laughs> so romantic. Wasps generally don't get the same treatment, even though most of them are pollinators as well. Yellow jackets are considered to be assholes that will sting even if you do as much as just look at them. I'm sorry, but I need to sidetrack here a bit. I've seen many instances of people claiming bees and wasps, but especially wasps and those giant Asian hornets can remember faces and come back to take revenge if you bother them. So obviously I looked into it, went down a little rabbit hole and turns out that they fucking can't. Who would have thought? It's always this article which showed that a certain species of paper wasps had the ability to learn the faces of other paper wasps. 
just as we can remember human faces very easily, but have problems differentiating between Pollock paintings after just a quick glance. You can learn, but it's not the same process in your brain. Bees can learn human faces, though. It takes them around 50 tries, and every time they have to be rewarded with sugar water, but only the same way you'd learn to tell colorful blobs apart. Also, if you try to kill a wasp, it gets away, and an hour later you get a wasp sting. How do you know it's the same wasp? That's right. You don't, because you don't remember wasp faces. I thought it was obvious that if a species can recognize faces from their own kind, that doesn't mean they are recognized faces of very different species just as easily. <sighs> Sorry about that, defying our will through their mindless autonomy, right? This is the same thing as how arachnophobes think a spider is vengeful and will attack them if you cause even a slight inconvenience to them. They just want to survive, they don't care about you all that much. Let's revisit the pin we did earlier. The insects that usually breach our boundaries but at the same time are not likely to get the same reaction from us as spiders and cockroaches are, get a different kind of reaction. They violate us. Consider bad bugs. Apart from feeding on our blood, they attack us while we are at our most vulnerable. In our sleep. I'm fortunate to have never experienced bad bugs, but their presence can have lasting psychological effects on someone. Even after they've been eradicated from one's home, they can have difficulty sleeping. They can feel the insects crawling on their skin while nothing is really there. I remember when I was around 14, 15, I slept in a bottomless stand at a summer camp once and would not leave me alone and even when there weren't any i could still feel them every sensation felt like ants it can make you feel like you're going mad imagine feeling that constantly and others keep telling you it's all in your head In the paper in question, Jay Traver described a perceived parasitic infestation she had been living with for a long time that she attributed to a rare kind of dust mites. She thought she got them from pets and at one point even describes some family members having them, but also not quite understanding how their infestation wasn't as bad as hers and it just seemed to go away for them. It was not until some time after my acute symptoms had subsided that other members of the family began to feel the effects of the mites. At no time have either of them suffered acutely from the presence of the mites. While for her it got progressively worse and no treatment seemed to work however harsh they might have been. She used over 20 different kind of chemicals, including bleach that she left on her skin for days at a time that was about eight times stronger than the commercial cleaning type. 40% aqueous hypo. This was allowed to dry on the scalp and was followed by a second application which was also allowed to dry. She obsessively collected evidence of the infestation, brought skin fragments and dust to her doctors, even sent some to parasitologists, but they never found anything. It followed that similar material, which was collected from my scalp and body and sent away to different parasitologists for examination, also yielded negative results. Years after the published paper, an expert in these kind of mites examined the things she collected and found the specimens she thought to be this rare kind of mite was actually the very common dust mite, found in nearly every household. Interestingly, there's information sprinkled around that weakens every bit of her claims. The harsh chemicals she used could have caused the severe irritation on her scalp, in her eyes, on her torso. At one point she even acknowledges this, but then goes on to dismiss it right away. 
She mentions how the mites were apparently under some thickened and inflamed parts of her skin, causing their host to almost tear off bits of the scalp in an effort to get rid of them. But she's adamant her injuries are not due to the constant agitation. Let's talk a bit about egg bomb syndrome. I want you to understand exactly why people believe hers is a textbook case of the delusion and not a real infestation. Egg bomb syndrome, also known as delusory parasitosis. Cases are usually categorized into two groups. Primary egg bomb syndrome, which develops without any underlying medical condition, and secondary, which develops due to a condition and the patient misinterprets the symptoms as a parasitic infestation. Sufferers experience tactile hallucinations, such as crawling sensations, itching, stinging, and sometimes they are also able to visualize the bugs themselves. Often these turn out to be pieces of lint or dirt when examined by an outsider. And since they strongly believe that the bugs are real, they are more likely to seek out entomologists or pest control instead of medical professionals. Secondary egg bomb is a lot easier to treat. Most often if you find the root of the problem, that can be a small skin infection, drug side effects, neuropathy caused by diabetes, stuff like that and treat the underlying problem successfully, the belief of the bug infestation goes away as well. The syndrome sometimes, in a in a not too compassionate way, is nicknamed cocaine bugs because the use of cocaine and amphetamines can cause these same tactile sensations of insects running around under your skin. Well, primary egg bomb is a different story. People affected have an unshakable belief that they are infested with some kind of insects, while there are no available physiological explanations for their symptoms. They are entirely psychosomatic, and you can't convince them of that fact. The saddest part about this is that antipsychotic drugs are proven to be effective in treating egg bomb syndrome, but good luck getting them to take their meds. It's likely that the same mechanisms are responsible for the feelings of box crawling in both primary egg bomb syndrome and amphetamine use. These drugs are known to block dopamine reuptake in the brain and the resulting excess dopamine is thought to be the reason behind the feelings of box crawling. So it's likely that people with egg bomb syndrome have a faulty dopamine reuptake system and that's causing their sensory hallucinations, but to my knowledge this theory hasn't been tested. Interestingly, even psychologists aren't immune to it, despite in theory understanding how delusions work. A case report from 2007 described a psychologist who was suffering from delusory parasitosis and rejected her diagnosis. She was apparently completely unable to see the inconsistencies in her story. That's how strong these beliefs can be. They tend to present a relatively consistent behavior pattern. They originate the infestation from somewhere specific. Pets, wool clothes, fruits they touched, and they can't get rid of the bugs and try a variety of methods which often, they claim, anger them and the bugs retaliate. These often very aggressive attempts at getting rid of the bugs result in a vicious cycle. They believe that the irritation caused by harsh chemicals, scabs caused by trying to excavate the bugs from under their skin are in fact caused by the bugs and are proof that their delusions are real. They often try to collect evidence and present it to a doctor or someone working with insects. This is called the matchbox sign, and it's incredibly common. Next up, even if they did end up talking to a psychiatrist or psychologist, they will likely dismiss the claims that there are no parasites under their skin and refuse treatment that would actually help them. She tried to capture the mites on several occasions. She managed to apparently capture some from her pillow and her scalp, but bear in mind, these mites are everywhere, especially in bats. And she mentions that she could find several other types of insects, but didn't suspect those to be the cause, even though many were captured more frequently than dust mites. The number of mites actually captured is surprisingly low. A rather amazing number of other arthropods have likewise been captured from the scalp in a similar fashion. Her doctors found nothing. One even directed her towards a neurologist after a three-day long observational stay at the hospital, 
whom she was apparently able to convince that she didn't need his help. A dermatologist was apparently convinced without more than a very casual examination that the patient's symptoms were largely imaginary, those that did exist having been caused by an ill-advised attempt on part of the patient. He turned me over to a neurologist for treatment for my psychoneurotic condition. The patient, however, succeeded in convincing the neurologist that she had no need of his services. She sent multiple samples to parasitologists who also couldn't find anything. Then instead of questioning the validity of her experience and her preconceptions, she goes on to label the doctors as incompetent frauds. She mentions multiple times how her doctors kept dismissing her symptoms as just a phobia. I venture to predict that if any dermatologist should become the host of this mite, he would not diagnose his case as just imagination. The thing is, they didn't dismiss her. They tried to help her. One even sent her to a specialist when he couldn't see any infestation, only severe irritation likely caused by a plethora of chemicals. People suffering from delusory parasitosis tend to be uncooperative and in some cases outright hostile. In 1967, for example, a woman tried to kill her family doctor after becoming convinced that he constructed a plot and got her infected. Her alcoholic husband shared her belief, but after she was institutionalized following the murder attempt, he gradually calmed down. Sorry, I don't speak French. Or shared delusions are quite common when it comes to egg bomb. It's not surprising. How many times did you scratch yourself since I started talking about insects under the skin? This is taken to the extreme in the 2006 horror thriller Bug. In this movie, a waitress fleeing her abusive ex-husband gets together with an awkward drifter who believes the government infested him with bugs. He pulls her into his delusions and for the duration of the movie they go through increasingly unsettling and horrific ways to get rid of the bugs. This movie is guilty of the trope when a horror premise is based on a poorly understood concept of a given mental illness, but it taps into some very basic fears. It's terrifying enough to believe something has invaded your body that, combined with the feeling that everyone is just trying to dismiss your claims, can be a recipe for disaster. Towards the end of her paper, Trevor pats herself on the back for doing all the work herself while no one was believing her. Still not realizing the thing she is put out is the most convincing piece of evidence of what she is experiencing being all in her head, to put it unkindly. Had it not been that the writer of this article was unwilling to accept the dermatologist's verdict, had sufficient knowledge on parasitology and had access to enough literature on this subject so that she was able to proceed on her own, the difficulties experienced would never have been attributed to their real cause. She shows the typical symptoms, feeling of insect crawling, an unshakable belief that doesn't change with evidence or the absence of evidence, the classic matchbox sign, not to mention the constant attempts at getting rid of the mites using unnecessarily harsh methods and blaming their effects on the bugs instead. When discussing her case, a question frequently comes up. She was an entomologist. She worked with insects, studied them. Shouldn't have she known better. As an entomologist, she should have seen the irrationality behind identifying an insect as the culprit that's never been known to parasitize humans, especially when she has decided on the insect species way before she's ever found one. Absolutely she should have. That's what makes her case so sad and somewhat ironic. Her mind completely betrayed her. The fact that she knew so much about insects combined with her delusion resulted in this paper, where her mind without her conscious efforts fabricated somewhat believable evidence for her. So, what can be done about this whole thing? First, let me tell you about a wonderful thing called retraction. 
Science isn't flawless. It's done by humans and we are inherently prone to mistakes. Sometimes errors slip in and in some cases malicious activity can produce wrong and fraudulent reports. One of the most famous retracted articles is the one that made the link between the MMR vaccine and autism. When you look at the actual article, there's retracted written across every page in big fat red letters so you can't miss it. The first author of the paper and the fraud who was behind the whole thing got paid to fabricate the report so a couple of people could sue vaccine manufacturers. He falsified data and results to get what he wanted. I think to this day it is one of the clearest examples of scientific misconduct. Retraction is an important tool in scientific publishing and in most cases it's done because of unintentional errors the scientist noticed when the article was already published. Like the Nobel laureate Jack Sostak who had to retract an article in 2017 after learning their findings were incorrect when they were unable to reproduce their results. He commented on the case as definitely embarrassing. <laughs> In Trevor's case, we can't talk about scientific misconduct. The data she has is false. She unknowingly fabricated the evidence she presented and the conclusions are not something a rational person would have come up with. Her condition made her incapable of interpreting the data correctly and all she wanted was to confirm her beliefs. It's in the nature of delusions. It's an unshakable belief in something that cannot be changed by any amount of evidence and this belief slowly takes over every aspect of the person's life. The article is so full of errors that you can completely disregard the person of the author and her condition and retract due to the science in the report being bad. So bad that it's a question how this even managed to slip through the peer review process. The whole thing isn't written in a consistent style and tone. I think the hostility towards the doctors and parasitologists who couldn't find what she was looking for is also quite telling. She jumps back and forth between first and third person storytelling. She talks about her doctors in a manner that's surprising to read, to say the least, in a scientific report. The evidence she offers isn't at all logical. Like the way she did some experiments on mice she found around her house that she suspected were the same kind that infected her. And she describes how surprisingly easy it was to kill them by just dropping them in some lukewarm water. One mite was killed in warm, not hot water in which it died very quickly. A second was immersed in Lysol solution. At 45 seconds, no movement could be detected. It is thus evident that the mites are susceptible and easily killed. But the same mite supposedly lived under her skin, rarely even resurfacing not being bothered by chemicals that would kill anything else. Considering that the above list of chemicals, many of which are purported to eradicate several species of mites, it would seem that the mites presently under consideration is much more difficult to deal with. It's full of stuff like that. She even admits that the number of mites she captured is surprisingly low, given the extent of the infestation and the fact that she was unable to find any under her skin didn't suggest that something else was going on, but instead that the bugs were in the deeper layers. It has never been possible to locate a mite in the slot of epidermis or in small incrustations. It seems probable that the burrows are actually in the dermis, where they apparently formed highways, invisible to the naked eye to travel from one location on her body to another. Even when such a burrow does not show externally, however, its presence is readily ascertained by reason of the activity of the mites, which habitually travel from one area to another along certain well-defined highways. A rational person, let alone an entomologist, never would have jumped to the conclusion that the infestation was due to dust mites, especially when countless professionals failed to find anything over the span of decades. She died when she was 80 years old and believes she was infested with the same dust mites for over 40 years and never got the treatment she actually needed. 
if and when retraction happens, they should be careful to establish their claims based on bad science and not the mental fitness of the author, as that could create a precedent of mentally ill people not being able to do research because of the stigma. Delusions aren't logical, and as it's clear that's the thing going on in this article, it will be clear to the well-trained eye every time going forward. The other reason why we should separate bad scientific practice and mental illness is because the opposite would likely harm other well-established scientists who are battling mental illness themselves. K. Ratfield Jamieson, for example, wrote an entire textbook on bipolar disorder that's still a very relevant piece while at the same time suffering from it. Being affected by an issue doesn't necessarily mean they can't be rational about it. And it's not just mental illness. Being part of a minority might inspire researchers to work on subjects that affect their communities. Bad science can be a product of an irrational mind, but the nature of delusions dictates that it only seems rational to the person suffering from it. And careful observers can see the inconsistencies in their stories. At the time of making this video, this paper isn't retracted. Travers delusory parasitosis diagnosis isn't contested by anyone in the field except for other sufferers who circulate the article among themselves as a sort of evidence of their own delusions. I wouldn't say this article has done a disservice to science because it really hasn't. Travers' claims aren't rational, they don't follow a logical path, and she is clearly grasping at straws to make the claims she is making. And any serious researcher can see that. This article has done a great disservice to people who suffer from delusory parasitosis, who see it as evidence of their delusions being real and therefore continue to refuse actual treatment that would help them. And no despite their illness being in their heads, as in brain, it is in fact not in their head, as the saying goes. What I mean here is that despite this being a psychiatric condition, there's treatment, and our society is somewhat getting better at addressing these conditions accordingly. Not merely as someone going crazy, but as an actual treatable medical condition.